Consign Me Not to Darkness by Care vs. Princess Chapter 13 Sansa He was dead. She didn't want to believe it. On her knees in the snow, Sansa placed her hands on Bran's arms and shook him. Gently at first and then with more force. Bran! Her voice was broken, pleading. No, please don't go, Bran. Come back! Tears blurred her vision and she could barely speak now. But she refused to give up, refused to dissolve into despair. Just, oh God, <laughs> please, Bran, please don't go. Sansa. Arya's voice was low and gentle and Sansa felt her sister's hand on her shoulder. But she wouldn't allow herself to look at her because if she looked at Arya, she would know there would be nothing stopping her from crying. Sansa, look at me. No! She shouted with all the force she could muster. No, Bran, he, he's our little brother. We can't give up on him. Arya, we can't. Sansa. She heard Arya's voice falter and she finally forced herself to turn around, finding tears running down her sister's cheeks as she cried silently. He's gone. She could not remember the last time she had watched Arya cry. And that's what did it for her. The first sob forcing its way out of her throat, Sansa got to her feet and wrapped Arya in an embrace, throwing her face into Arya's hair as she wept openly. He was dead. Her little baby brother, dead to save them all. And now, as she and Arya held each other, Sansa allowed herself to weep for all those that she had lost. A father, a mother, a wolf, and now three of her brothers. <laughs> there was a rustling sound amongst the trees, followed by boots crunching in the snow. And Sansa reluctantly looked up to see John enter the godswood. One of his arms was dangling limply by his side, clearly injured. His hair frosted with ice and his armour stained with blood. Whether the blood was his, Sansa could not say. In his hand, Long Claw was smoking and he dropped it into the snow, causing the metal to hiss. His grey eyes fixated on the empty shell that had once been Bran Stark. Oh, God. Sansa broke away from Arya and threw herself into his arms, sobbing. John hugged her back as best he could with only one good arm, and a moment later Arya came and joined them. Her arms wrapped around John's waist, her body pressed up against Sansa's. Stop crying, you stupid girl! Sansa chided herself silently. You are a stark, a wolf! You must be brave! But the tears kept coming. He said, Arya began, her voice hoarse from the string of tears, to tell you that it was all worth it. That you were all worth it. And just like that, he walked, even though he knew it would kill him. He sacrificed himself. Oh, God. John repeated, mostly to himself, still hope holding them both. Sansa wondered if he was in shock and hoped he hadn't lost too much blood. She was cold and her throat was raw, and Sansa didn't know when or if she'd ever stop crying. I told myself I would protect him. She sobbed into John's chest. But I couldn't. <laughs> no one can protect anyone, she remembered saying once. And God, she felt so stupid for thinking it could be any different. Why couldn't it have been me? John's arm tightened around her immediately and his lips found her forehead. Don't say that, Sans. He whispered to her, Gods, don't ever say that. He made his choice, Arya added. She seemed to have regained control of herself and let go of John and Sansa to wipe furiously at her tear-stained cheeks. There was nothing any of you could have done. There was nothing any of us could have done. He saved us all. 
John said, but his eyes weren't on Sansa. They were staring across the gods' wood at Bran's eternally frozen face. He died a hero. They were both right, Sansa knew. But in the moment, their words were little consolation to her. They had already lost so much. Why was it that any of them had to die at all? Why couldn't there there have been another way? They stood together for what felt like an eternity. Together, yet also alone in their, with their grief. Sansa crying until she felt there were no more tears left in her body. Even after she had stopped crying, her eyes felt swollen and raw, and John wrapped his good arm around her shoulders as they both walked back inside towards Winterfell. Arya stood at John's other side, carrying both John's sword and her own. Her eyes trained firmly on the ground as she walked. They had left Bran's body behind, John unable to lift it with his injured arm, and the weight too much for Arya and Sansa. But Sansa had closed his eyes for the last time, and John had covered the body with his cloak. Later, they would go back to get him and then they would put his body in the crypt. But Sansa wasn't ready to think about that yet. She didn't want to think about her little brother in the ground. We should make a statue for him, Sansa blurted out, causing both John and Ari to look at him, her. I know it's not tradition, but I think he deserves one. Her father had had statues made for her uncle Brandon and her aunt Lyanna even though neither of them had ever ruled Winterfell. So it seemed only right that Bran should get one too. John nodded. You're exactly right. We'll have one made right away. The field was littered with bodies, beyond counting, and the air smelled like blood, smoke and death. As they approached the gates, she saw Lord Tyrion and Sir Jorah come out to greet them and Sansa felt a spark of relief when she saw that Tyrion was alive and unharmed. But then she remembered that Bran was dead, and the joy was gone. Her eyes met Tyrion's, and that one look was enough to make his face fall. She didn't have to say it. He already knew. Sir Jorah squared his jaw. Your grace, he said solemnly to John. The maester is tending to her grace. You should go to her. Is she all right? Jorah said nothing for a moment. She's alive. His pause spoke volumes. John nodded stiffly. Take me to her. He kissed both Sansa and Arya on the top of their heads, and then followed Sir Jorah into the castle. Silently, Sansa hoped that Daenerys would pull through. She did not want her family to suffer another loss. Lord Tyrion approached them and tentatively took Sansa's hand, clasping it between both of his. Lady Stark, I am truly very sorry for your loss. Sansa sniffed. Thank you, my lord. Your brother is alive. I'm glad to hear it. She wasn't lying when she said it either. At least one of them did not lose their brother today. I know this is little consolation, Lord Tyrion continued, but I am very thankful to see that you are alive and unharmed, my lady. Sansa nodded and squeezed his hand, and I am grateful to see you, my lord. Bran was gone, but she was still here. Arya was still here. Jon was still here. The pack survived. For now, that had to be enough. Brienne. He was dead. The battle was over, the living had won, but Brienne remained in place, melt in the snow. Podrick's limp body in her arms. I'm so sorry, she whispered, even though she knew he could not hear. Her words carried away on a northern wind. He had deserved much more than this. He hadn't deserved to die. Brienne? She looked up as Tormund the giant's being approached her from behind. 
trying to keep her tears at bay. She did not have the energy to deal with the waddling man's antics right now. What is it? She wanted to snap at him, but the words came out sounding sad and broken. Tormund knelt down beside her and wrapped an arm around her, but it wasn't one of his bawdy commons, just a comforting arm around her shoulder. Brienne saw that there was no javelity in his eyes now, only remorse. It's over. You did everything you could. Brienne opened her mouth and then closed it. She wanted to weep. She said nothing, placing Podrick's body down in the snow and allowing Torment to help her to her feet. Brienne shot Podrick's eyes and Torment took off his fur cloak and draped it over the boy's corpse. He was the greatest squire who ever lived, she said, her voice thick from impending tears. Aye, Torment agreed solemnly. He was. Brienne knew that Torment didn't know anything about what being a squire entailed. That it was a foreign concept to a member of the Free Folk. But in that moment, she didn't care. Allowing him to be nice to her in her moment of grief. For once, she was tired of being strong and wanted to be comforted. Just this once. So she could al allow him to lead her back towards Winterfell. As they walked, she looked around, examining the corpses fallen across the battlefield. The br blood bright red against the freshly fallen snow. Above them, the clouds had parted and the sky had cleared. A grey sun began to peek out of the faraway mountain tops. She examined the faces of the dead men. There was Yon Royce, the Lord of the Vale, many unsullied and Othraki who had fallen where they stood. A knot formed in Brienne's throat when she saw a woman sobbing over the corpse of a girl that, and she recognised her as little Liza Woolfield, one of the girls Arya had trained. She had been only nine. Where is Sir Jamie? Brienne blurted out. She realised she had not seen him in quite a while. After Podrick fell, she had lost Jamie and Sir Bronn in the ensuing chaos. Tormund gave her a knowing smile. Your lover boy is gonna be fine. Just had a few superficial wounds. He's not my lover, Brienne insisted, but Tormund only shook his head and chuckled to himself. No need to deny it. You love him. It's clear enough to see. Now, Lon Lannister better treat you right. Otherwise, he'll have to deal with me. Brienne looked away and resisted the urge to smile. It was then she spotted a man with thinning, sandy-coloured hair, knelt in the snow, hovering over the corpse of a large man. He must have been tall in life, because his legs, that were now splayed on the limp on the ground, looked longer than Brienne's own. Lord of Light! The kneeling man was saying, his hands on the dead man's chest. Cast your light upon this man, your servant. Bring him back from death and darkness. His flame has been extinguished. Restore it! Lord of Light, cast your... Brienne stopped in her tracks. Oh, gods, I know who that is. She broke away from Torma to rush over, and sure enough, her fears were immediately confirmed. An increasingly frantic Beric Dondarrion was repeating this chant to the Lord of Light, to seemingly no result. The man laying still and dead on the ground had a half-furt face, and a stab wound seemingly gone through his heart, blood oozing from his wound down to the breastplate of his armour. Come on, Clegane! Dondarrion yelled, frustrated. He grabbed the hound by his shoulders and shook him. You have to wake up! It's not your time yet! Tears filled Brienne's eyes. She could hear Tormund walk up behind her and place his hands gently on her shoulders. But she was not looking at him. Here she was, crying over the hound of all people, the man she had once nearly fought to the death with. And yet, despite her turbulent history... Over the past few weeks, she had begun to feel a grudging respect for him. She had seen that he cared, cared about Arya, even if he liked to pretend he didn't. Brienne thought there was so much more to Sandor Clegane than they knew. And now he was dead. He's gone, Dondarrion. 
foreman said. Best give it up. No! The lightning lord persisted stubbornly. No, it's not his time to die. I, I saw it in my flames. He's supposed to go to King's Landing. He has to kill his brother. It's the lord's will. If it was your lord's will, then why is he dead right now? Torman said matter-of-factly. Come inside. We'll count our dead later. Still, Beric refused to give up, pressing his hands more desperately against the hound's chest, murmuring his chant over and over again. There is nothing you can do, Brienne added. She shook her head. Maybe if Thoros was still alive. And suddenly, Beric froze. What is it? Brienne asked. Was it something she said? My lady. Even as Beric spoke to her, his words did not leave Clegane's body. You are exactly right. Right about what? Tormund asked. Don Darien, the cold is starting to go to your head. No, it's not. He stood up and walked over to Brienne, giving her his hand a gentle squeeze. I am no Thoros of Mere. It's true. But there is something I can do. They call it the kiss of life. Or the last kiss. Brienne wrinkled her nose in confusion. You think you can bring him back this way? I know I can. But Brienne tra Beric trailed off, a melancholic look in his gaze. I have died seven times already. I do not have much life left in me. If I bring Clegane back... He didn't finish the sentence, but Brienne knew what he meant. And it seemed Torment did too. Sacrifice yourself, he said. Are you out of your mind? Beric smiled, but there was no joy behind it. Possibly. He looked at Brienne. Can you tell the boy I'm sorry? I sold him. I thought it was the right thing to do at the time. And as for Arya? Well, you can tell the girl it's one more name off of her list. Are you sure this is what you want to do? Brienne asked. As much as she wanted to see the Hound come back, this would mean Beric would willingly give up his life. It was not something to take lightly. I have never been so certain of anything. It is the Lord's plan. I am ready. His voice was firm, eyes resigned to his fate. And so Brienne forced herself to nod. I'll tell them. Goodbye, Lord Beric. Goodbye, Lady Brienne. Tormund was not particularly good at emotional goodbyes, so he nodded his head and clamped a hand on Beric's shoulder. You're a good man, Beric Dondarrion. As are you, Tormund Giantsbane. Dondarrion knelt down in the snow again, placing his hand on the hound's bleeding chest, and closing his eyes for prayer. Lord of light, cast your light upon us all. And then he brought the hound's lips to his. At first, it looked like nothing had happened, and Brienne thought it hadn't worked. But then she heard Tormund's sharp intake of breath. When she looked again, she saw that the blood was no longer dripping down the hound's armour, and she watched in awe as one of his legs twitched, then moved. Don Derek smiled ever so slightly, and with that final smile, he collapsed onto the ground. The hound opened his eyes. Aria, she wanted more than anything to go back to that morning. This couldn't be real. Maybe if she shut her eyes, she'd opened them and realised that this was all a dream. She'd be back in the forge, wrapped up in Gendry's arms, warm in his embrace even though the fire had gone out hours ago. And Gendry would smile at her in that way that made her stomach flutter. Bran would be alive and she would be with Gendry, both of them alive and safe and whole. But this was no dream. Her little brother was gone. Her pregnant sister-in-law had just taken a tumble from a dragon that could possibly kill her. And in her mind, she was replaying that moment over and over again of how she had watched Gendry fall injured in the snow. Arius and Lord Tyrion saw Sansa up to her room, 
Her sister had stopped crying now and seemed to have gotten a hold of her emotions, though she wanted to lay down and try to sleep. I'll be all right, she told Arya, but it's been an exhausting day and I want to be alone for a while. Lord Tyrion agreed, saying some rest could do the more some good, and excused himself to retire to his chambers. Arya kissed Sansa on both cheeks and saw her sister into bed and closed the door on her way out. Arya couldn't sleep though. There were too many thoughts buzzing around her mind and she knew sleep would bring her no peace if she could even sleep to begin with. She could go and check on Daenerys, but John was with her now and he probably wanted to be alone with his wife. She could go and make sure Bran's body was being tended to properly, for Arya knew the sight of her brother's corpse would likely only make her cry again. No, what she needed was Gendry. She needed to look upon his face to make sure he was all right. And if he wasn't all right, she wouldn't only allow herself to even think that. She could not lose Gendry the same day she had lost Bran. The thought was too horrible for her. There is only one God and his name is Death, Arya told herself. And what do we say to the God of Death? Not today. She looked all over the castle and found no sign of Gendry. The casualties were being brought in on stretches and the dead piled up in the courtyard to be identified and ultimately buried. The injured brought into the Great Hall to be treated. Arya walked up and down the Great Hall and didn't see Gendry anywhere. And then with a heavy heart, she looked at the dead bodies and luckily did not find him there either. She walked back out onto the battlefield. Hundreds of men were still lying there where they had fallen and healers were treating those with the most urgent injuries on the field. As Arya walked around, she spotted Sir Davos, but any relief she felt at seeing a familiar face waned when she saw that the Onion Knight was forlornly watching a stretcher that was carried towards Winterfell. Gendry! Sir Davos! She called out as she walked towards him. Gendry! Is he? She couldn't bear herself to speak the word. He's alive, my lady. Davos assured her, and Arya exhaled. But I think you had best go back inside. Arya's gaze blazed stubbornly. She had not come this far just to be turned away. I will see him. She tried to brush past him, but Sir Davos wrapped his arms around her, holding her back. My lady, he began to say, he is in a sorry state. I don't think you should see him like this. But Arya didn't care about that. All she could think about was getting to Gendry no matter what, and she would be damned if she let anything stop her. Let go of me, Sir Davos. She didn't want to yell at the old man, but when he refused to release her, she raised her voice. Let go of me, milady. Arya didn't even let him finish his sentence, instead bursting from his grip and racing across the field towards Gendry before Sir Davos could even blink. She practically catapulted herself at the stretcher and wrapped her arms around Gendry's waist. He was not warm like he was this morning. He was just cold. But his chest was still rising and falling. Proof that he still lived. Oh, God, Gendry. For the first time, Arya could see the hole in his chest. The White Walker's spear having ripped through his left breastplate, leaving a bloody mess of muscle and sinew. Why did you go and have to jump on top of a white walker for me, you bloody idiot? One of the healers tentatively reached out to touch her shoulder. Milady, perhaps you should not see. Arya only shrugged him off. My sister is the lady of this castle, and you cannot make me go if I don't want to. This seemed to shut them up. Is he going to be all right? The healers looked warily at each other. Hard to say, the first one said. He's lost quite a lot of blood, enough to make him pass out. We can clean and tend his wound, but we don't know if he has enough strength left to wake up again. 
And if this wound gets infected, he's strong. Aria wanted to sound confident in her assertion, but her voice faltered. She ran a hand gently down Gendry's cheek. He's one of the strongest people I know. Even so, my lady. The second healer said in a soft voice, you'd best prepare yourself for the worst. My lady, they keep calling me that. Aria wanted to laugh, but it came out like a choked sob. Gendry's the only one who can allow to call me that. Can I have a moment with him? She asked. Before you take him. The healers nodded and placed the stretcher down, saying they would leave her alone and come back in two minutes. Aria took his hand in hers and she found it cold and limp. I swear, Gendry, you stubborn, stupid bull. She whispered hoping that in some way or another he was able to hear what she was saying to him. If you die without my permission, you won't rest easy. I'll chase you through all seven hells. She couldn't get the teasing statement out without her eyes filling with tears, and Ari swallowed the knot rising in her throat. I need you, Gendry. Please don't leave me in this world without you. I can't. I can't lose. I can't lose another person I love. Yes, Arya realised with a crushing certainty that she loved him. She had loved him for a very long time, in fact. She didn't remember when it had begun. And now that she realised it, there was a chance that she might lose him forever. She pressed her lips to his brow. I love you, you bull-headed idiot. Please don't die. Please come back to me. Soon after, the healers returned, and Arya reluctantly pulled away. After one last squeeze of Gendry's hand, allowing them to carry him inside, she was so lost in her own thoughts that she did not hear Sir Davos approach her from behind, and until his hand gently touched her shoulder. Milady. Arya said nothing only turning around and collapsing against the older man's chest, tears flowing before she could stop them. After a moment's hesitation, Sir Davos lifted his arms and wrapped them around her, running a hand up and down her back soothingly. I know, Lady Arya, I know. And for the first time in a very long time, Arya Stark let herself be comforted. John, when he got up to their chambers, Daenerys had been placed down on the bed. Mr. Vulcan was there to look her over. Sam was in charge of stripping her armour off of her, while Gilly sat by her bedside, wiping the blood from her face with a damp cloth. On her other side, Miss Sande sat with Daenerys's limp hand in her own, silent tears streaming down her face. Ghost bounded into the room ahead of John and positioned himself at the foot of the bed, whining softly as he sat vigil. His white fur was still matted with dirt and blood. How is she? John asked as he rushed to Daenerys' side and sat on the edge of the bed, hand running gently across her cool forehead. Her skin was ghastly pale and waxy. She looked like death. She is alive, my king, the maester said. However, she seems to have been knocked unconscious in her fall, and I do not know when she will wake up again. But she will wake up again? Jorah asked. He remained in the doorway, watching but out of the way of the maester at work. Mr. Walken hesitated. I believe she might, but right now it is impossible to ascertain. John could feel a lump raising in his throat, but he forced it down, attempting to keep the tears at bay. He could feel them threatening to rise, pricking the back of his eyes. What about the baby? Did she hit her stomach in the fall? I don't think so. She landed on her back when John caught her, but it was impossible to know if she had whacked her stomach on the way down. Well, Mr. Walken sighed, babes are well protective in their mother mother's wombs, and they can withstand more than you may think. There have been no traces of blood in her small clothes, and if her grace was going to miscarry, I think it would have happened by now. That being said, it is only two, two and a half months gone at most, and the child has no chance of surviving outside the womb. 
If we were to lose her, we would lose them both. John forced himself to nod. Do whatever you can to save her. He had already lost his brother today. He could not bear to lose the love of his life as well. Gilly had finished cleaning Daenerys' face and she stood up. But then she paused. John, your shoulder. He glanced at it. Blood had seeped through his clothes and his shoulder bone was protruding. He popped it out of its socket during the fight and his arm was overcome with a numbing tingle. At first it had hurt, but now he felt nothing at all. Don't worry about it, Lee said. It barely hurts. You can't move your arm, Sam interjected. Let Maester Walken look at you. You may have broken something. I'm fine, John insisted more firmly this time. Maester Walken can tend to me later. Right now I'd like a moment alone with my wife. The others looked at each other warily and Sir Jorah cleared his throat. <clears throat> the king is right, he said. Let us give him a moment. Come. Sam and Gilly silently agreed, Sam carrying off Daenerys's armour to be cleaned, and Gilly throwing the now bloody cloth into the wash basin. Hesitantly, Walken also left the room. Miss Sande rose to her from her seat, but John waved the crying woman off. You can say, Miss Sande. She looked devastated, and she was Danny's best friend. If she were conscious, Daenerys would probably want her there. The foreign woman sat back down, and Jorah closed the door behind him, leaving the two of them alone with Danny. Is there anything I can get you, Miss Sunday? John asked. Water? Tea? A blanket? She shook her head. No, thank you, Your Grace. I am sorry I am crying. If there is anything, I should be asking you how you are. Nonsense. You don't need to apologise for caring about Daenerys. Miss Sande sniffled and nodded, rubbing da Daenerys's cold hand between her own. For a long moment, she said nothing. Grey Worm is dead. Having not known. Miss Sande, I am so sorry. I knew there was a chance this could happen. Miss Sande said. Last night, he made me promise not to cry for him. I do not know if it's out of a promise I can keep. No one would blame you if you didn't. He didn't know what else to say. When you lost someone you loved, no amount of kind words could make it better. Only time could heal those wounds. I know how horrible it is to lose someone you love. Egret suddenly came into his mind. John had not thought about her in quite a while. Despite that, her death was something he could not quite get over. And he didn't think he ever would be. She had been his first heartbreak, and he had loved her desperately, even though he had known they could never be together. When he closed his eyes, he could still see that night at Castle Black vividly, as if it was playing out before him his eyes meeting hers, that little swell of joy he had felt upon seeing her. Despite the circumstances, how the light went out in her eyes as she breathed her last in his arms. He did not know how, if he could survive that kind of pain again. Losing Daenerys would be even worse than losing Ygritte. She was his wife, the mother of his unborn child. The person who he had promised to spend the rest of his life with. Selfishly, he did not want their story to end here. They hadn't had enough time. He could spend a thousand years by Daenerys' side, and it still wouldn't be enough to satisfy him. He was hers, and she was his. And even though they'd only known each other less than a year, he already couldn't fathom a life without her in it. How could he know a joy in the world where she was gone? Had he ever really known what it was before she came into his life? She has to wake up, Miss Sande said, lifting Daenerys' hand to her mouth and pressing her lips against it. Daenerys, please come back to us. Miss Sande was always courteous. Always your grace this and my queen that. But right now... She was not a servant or an advisor. 
She was just a friend. She's strong, John said, his voice strained from impending tears. He bent down to press his lips gently against Daenerys's forehead, brushing her silver hair off her face. Ghost got up from the bed, moved closer to John, rubbing his face against his master's knee in what was meant to be a comforting fashion. She'll survive this. She's Daenerys Stormborn. She makes miracles happen. John did not know if his words were meant to comfort Missandei himself or both. All he could do was hope and pray that Daenerys had one last miracle left in her. End of chapter. Hi guys, hope you enjoyed this. That was the penultimate one. Oh boy, a lot of grief, a lot of grief. Not fun at all. Not fun. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this. That was actually really, really hard. And actually, my throat's getting a bit sore. I've recorded several chapters today. Remember to like, comment and subscribe. And hit that bell to get notified for whenever I upload a new video. Please remember to check me out on Twitter as well. I love you guys. Have a good day, night or whatever time zone you're in. Bye, my guys, gals and non-binary pals. I'll see you in another chapter. Bye.